Good morning, everyone. My name is Justin, and uh, you know when Adam brought this up a couple months ago, we were talking about the series, and it, he said we're talking about doing this. I thought, well, that sounds like a really good idea. And then when I watched a couple minutes of the debate, I thought, oh no, this is going to be awful. <laughs> but, but it's been really fun uh, getting to talk with these guys a little bit. Um, we've had a couple of uh, cases where we got to get together, talk about things, talk about football, talk about uh, music taste, heavy metal, and all of that. Uh, and, and so I'm really looking forward to this morning and, and what we got to do. So I want to thank both of you, uh, both Rob and Nathan, for you know, being so dedicated to the church. We got Rob, who's the lead guitar player here, you know, and, and Nathan with the students, and as uh, one of the ushers back there, it's, it's really a pleasure to be up here with you guys. So what I want to start with is the first week of the series, Adam posed a question, and we're going to start with that, and we'll start with Rob on this one. Uh, so Rob, to what extent, if any, do you value uh, belonging to a church community where it's safe for both sides of the political aisle? Well, I put place an uh, infinitely high value on it. In fact, I'd go so far as to say, if we want to be a church uh, in the New Testament sense of the word, we can't adopt one political ideology to the, the exclusion of another. It's, it's great to have strong political or social or cultural views on things. And it's great to be active on an individual basis. But where I see some churches go off the rails is when they try to impose that sort of value on a church congregation where our real purpose here is to get together to encourage one another, to build one another up, to equip one another so that we can serve God and, and love one another and uh, love our neighbors so much better. And political stuff tends to get in the way and causes division, which is the worst thing in the world for the church. Yeah, yeah. So what do you see as your individual role in that? Well, I, I don't see my individual role as particularly different from anybody else's, that we all have a obligation and we should all ultimately desire to love one another deeply from our, the heart and think the things that we've lectured our kids about when we've been raising our kids in the faith about let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth but only that which is for edification that it gives grace to the person that hears it and we can we can talk about political issues if we keep that in mind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much nathan same question to you to what extent do you value belonging to a church where it's safe on both sides of the political aisle? Yeah, so w when I first saw this question, uh, a story came up in my mind, one of uh, an experience I had that was formative. And when I was 18 years old, I went and visited a friend of mine in Seattle. And we attended a Sunday service at Mount Zion Baptist Church, which is this really cool historic black church in Seattle. It was founded in like the late 1800s. Um, and when I went, it was right in the midst of the bush carry election cycle. And we might think of that as quaint now, but at the time, people perceived that as being a really vitriolic election. And um, I remember that Sunday when the preacher got up, he said something like this. It's been over a decade now for me, but uh, um, it was something like this. He said, when I came to church this morning, he said, I walked through our parking lot, and I noticed all of these John Kerry bumper stickers in our parking lot. He said, and I teared up. He said, I realized we've been called as a global church to be the bride of Christ. And we're over here living like we're the harem of Christ. And folks, I'm here this morning to tell you that when Christ returns, he's returning for a bride, not a harem. And he then went on and uh, talked about the kind of the role that he saw for his church um, to be agents of political reconciliation in the church and in the Seattle community. And I think those words were prophetic. I think they apply today to us here. Um, yeah, and it really left an impact on me. Yeah, that's wonderful. So what do you see as, as your role in promoting that around here? So for me, there's two things. The first is when I'm having a political discussion with someone I disagree with. Um, <clears throat> the on most things, but not all things. But anyway, the, the first thing I try to do is I always pay them the respect of assuming they have the most reasonable and most virtuous positions that I can think of for holding the views that they have. So instead of straw manning their argument, I try to steel man their argument. Um, <clears throat> and then the second role is when I'm having political conversations with people I agree with. Um, we're just sitting there talking about, you know, co-commiserating or whatever. 
I try to be an advocate of those we disagree with. So I try to be an advocate for their goodness, for their reasonableness. And I, uh, a story came to my mind when I was thinking about this, where um, uh, about a month ago I was having beers with a buddy, and we were sitting down and talking about religion and talking about politics. And at the end of the evening, um, he looked over at me and he cracked a smile and he said, Nathan, you might be the first Protestant Democrat who's ever co tried to convince me that I should be a Catholic Republican. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I don't know if he meant it as a compliment, but I took it as one. That's good. That's very good. So one of the things we talked about in our, in our little get-togethers was the risks involved with doing something like this and being vulnerable, getting out uh, up in front of the group and talking and, and how that would be perceived by others that are watching online or watching here in the room. And so, Nathan, one of the risks for Rob, uh, being that he, he's someone who favors Trump over Biden, is that he's going to be automatically categorized as a racist just because of who he's likely voting for. How would you respond to that? So... So I've already voted. I've voted for Joe Biden, and I voted for Hillary Clinton before that, and for President Obama twice before that. Um, and so I want to speak frankly to those of you here or watching that would identify with that voting track record, and to say it's really important that we are precise and we're disciplined in our speech. Um, if we take an honest look at our recent history, the 20th century is littered with the bodies of millions of people killed by left-wing movements for the crime of belonging to so-called oppressor classes. The language is dangerous, and you know I, I'm not naive on this. I, I know um, my wife is the granddaughter of a Mexican immigrant. Um, my youngest daughter is black and was born in Ethiopia, and after the Christchurch shootings and the Dylan Roof shooting, I, I know there are people who would attack and kill my family just because of their race or their ethnic heritage. But I'm convinced that if that kind of attack were to occur, I'm convinced that Rob would give his life, if necessary, to defend my family. And Again, speaking to people that tend to agree with me more on politics, if, if we're going to use the same pejorative term to describe the sort of person who would attack people because of their race, that we would describe someone who would die defending victims from that kind of an attack, then we've gotten dangerously loose in our language, a dangerous lack of precision. You know, if, if you hear a policy position and you're tempted to say that that position is racist, maybe stop and think, if what you mean by that is I'm concerned that this particular position might have a negative disparate impact on people in specific communities, then say that. Be precise in your language. Yeah, thank you. So Rob, one of the risks for Nathan being up here, as, as someone who voted for Biden, is that it puts his uh, commitment to his Christian faith in question. How can a Christian support Biden? How would you respond to that? Well, as it applies to, to Nathan Bilyeu in particular, um, if, if someone would ever question his faith, I would say they do not know him or they're a flaming idiot. <laughs> I know Nathan very, very well, and I know uh, his, he's the kind of person, his faith is so strong. One of the reasons I like to hang out with him so much is because I feel like just that connection with a person like Nathan makes me better, makes me a better person, makes me stronger in the faith. So it's the height of absurdity to, to suggest that. But more specifically, as far as, uh, uh, you know, in conservative evangelical circles, for sure, there's this, how could you support Biden and still call yourself a Christian? A lot of that has to do with the abortion issue. Um, but when you take a big picture view, Democrats in general are perceived, at least the media portrayal is, that the Democrats can be more sensitive to social issues, uh, more caring about the poor, more uh, interested in taking care of widows and orphans, um, and that their policies, at least that's the perception, um, are more aligned with Christian values. And therefore, it's 
perfectly reasonable for, for a Christian to analyze that. And if, and if she comes to the conclusion or he comes to the conclusion that overall the policies of Biden or the Democrats are more in line with my faith, I'm not going to question that. I, I see that very clearly that that's an ex, a perfectly legitimate position to hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, very good. Well, thank you. And it looks like right now, drug legalization is the top of the list. <laughs> yes. So this is where I'm going to just step aside and let you guys go ahead. <laughs> so it's weird to do this. because Normally when Rob and I have conversations, it's more like this. But um, We're yes. talking to these people as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying it. Too. But so I think I would start from the position and... So, I mean, just as far as like putting it out there and then we'll work back to justification, but I would support broad drug legalization, um, <clears throat> not just marijuana, but probably more broadly. And, and for me, I think we have to reason backwards from first pr principles. So we establish a premise, right? And then we work backwards to see sort of what are our logical conclusions from there. And I, uh, the reason that I support drug legalization because I don't think that addiction is something that's uh, sensitive to legal regulation or to price. So by outlawing it, making it expensive, I don't think we reduce use of these drugs. And I don't think that uh, by making something illegal that we eliminate the social factors that cause people to use. But don't you think that making it legal will increase the, the use of cocaine or whatever the... Um, whatever the drug of choice is. I don't. A, it doesn't seem to be a good reason to think people use less cocaine in America than they do in countries where it's legalized. We see, I mean, whether it's cocaine or whether it's heroin, whether it's methamphetamine, I don't think, th and, and that's where we come down to these first premises, that I don't see any reason to believe that uh, the social factors that cause you to use something uh, as addictive of that, you're not drawn to it. Well, you know, it's illegal, so I probably better not. I was thinking about meth, but it's illegal. I, I've, I've never known anyone for whom the legality of that was the factor. Well, those, this, this is a broader question. And to what extent, if any, should the uh, laws reflect um, morality and the, and the behaviors that we would like to encourage in society because I'm assuming you don't want to encourage meth use despite wanting to legalize it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think you're right, but the problem I have is what, who would, what would be the casualties of our virtue signaling there, right? So we'd create a law that says cocaine or meth or whatever is illegal. Well, well then what happens and who suffers for that? And I think that you have crime that arises out of the black market, the drug trade, there's crime related to that. You have crime related to addicts trying to feed a very expensive addiction. Um, and then you have, you know, the fact that, and this does come to the disparate impacts, but it's random what drugs get legalized and which ones don't, right? Like opiates aren't illegal, but you can become addicted. Certain communities, so if you're, in a sense, you get addicted to an opioid and you get, you know, your family finds out, well, you go to rehab. But you get addicted to cocaine, you go to prison, and you got a felony record. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true, because if you're addicted to an opioid to the point where you're, um, are you talking about when, when you actually get so addicted to it, your prescriptions run out, and so you have to go get it elsewhere? Because that's a crime, too. Well, it could be, and then, and then we could talk about how to manage that, but I was just talking more generally about the, the various, the randomness in which we schedule drugs, the randomness in which crimes or penalties are assigned to various kinds of drugs, um, and just the randomness that in which we say, lots of us have crutches, right? Like, lots of us have things that we take that sort of help blunt the pain of everyday life, um, after a hard day, I like to sometimes sit down with a beer. Um, that, that doesn't devastate my ability to provide for my family. That doesn't put, you know, rob my kids of a father while I'm in jail. But if you get addicted to meth, that's a different story, right? Well, right. And, and that would be my point, is that I guess if, if we could identify those factors, like it, 
it wouldn't be healthy for me, whether my crutch is chocolate or whether it's meth, I shouldn't be using something as a crutch to deal with whether it's stress or it's anxiety. Um, but, but wait a second. If you, if you get addicted to chocolate, I mean, versus getting addicted to meth, you don't see practical consequences for your family. I mean, if you get addicted to chocolate, so yeah, you get fat. You get addicted to meth and you end up dead or you end up strung out so bad that you end up committing crimes to, to support your addiction. I've never, maybe people actually commit crimes to support their chocolate addiction, but you don't hear much about it anyway. Well, but you made an interesting point there, right? So what do you think is the number one killer of men in the United States? Heart disease. Yeah. So you, you laughed at that possibility to eat too much chocolate, right? You get overweight. Yeah, but then you're, you're, presu you're presupposing that the heart disease rate is caused by chocolate, which I don't think we can necessarily make that cause and effect connection. No, but I do think the American diet probably has something to do with that, right? Well, yeah. And we're, we're getting off track from drugs a little bit, but my point being... But, but it is my point that it's random which sort of unhealthy behaviors we stigmatize. And so it comes we should open the door to more unhealthy behaviors by making them legal. No, what we shouldn't do is arbitrarily imprison people um, because of them. We shouldn't. Uh, one of the other side effects of the war on drugs that I think is particularly pernicious is just the burden it puts on our law enforcement, the kind of just horrendous accidents. You know, when we, when we look at the tragedy that happened to Breonna Taylor, apparently they were serving a warrant for marijuana. Like, a woman is dead? Officers were indicted by a grub jury over weed? No, they, Like, this is insane. No, she, she's dead because her boyfriend shot at the cops. Right, but all this whole confrontation came about, and this is part of the problem with the war on drugs, with no-knock warrants that get served. They knocked, by the way. I know, well, they, but they had a no-knock warrant, right? They and did. so the reason, I, I, so I was general counsel with the U.S. Marshals in, in, when I was in law school, and I know we actually analyzed why we, whether we, when and when, why we would use a no-knock warrant, and they're usually used to preserve evidence, right? As you know that if you knock, they, you know, the, the cocaine gets flushed down the toilet or something. But that, to me, is just insane. We're going to put officers in a situation where you have, so when you talked about her boyfriend, uh, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, you know, you have someone who would be in their house, someone busts into your door in the middle of the night, right? And you're lawfully allowed to defend yourself. And the officer sees someone pulling a gun, and they're allowed to defend themselves, all over preserving drug evidence. Like, that's, that's the thing, is people are dying over such an odd and small thing to me. Like, I just... Over weed. Well, how many people, though, I mean, think about it from a statistical, we, neither one of us have the numbers, but what would you estimate is a greater cause of people's dying? Uh, the execution of a no-knock warrant or people dying of drug overdoses? Which do you think is more prevalent? Well, I'm sure more people die from drug overdoses. My question is whether prohibition is helping that at all. Right? And whether the fact that, you know, like if you add in not just the no-knock warrant, but if you add in all the crimes by the cartels, which wouldn't be there if this wasn't a black market product. If you add in all of the crimes that addicts engage in to feed their very expensive addiction because of prohibition has made it so illegal, well, and addiction's not price sensitive. Well, wait a second. If, if somebody, if so you wave a magic wand and you legalize heroin, you, you're operating under the assumption that that would just drive the price way down? Like the pharmaceutical companies would not go, hey, this is a great payday for us. And then especially when we have addicts who will pay whatever they can, um, do you really think that it would drive the price of illegal drugs down to legalize them? Yes. And if so, why? So I think it would because <coughs> it's just the law, it's supply and demand, right? It's the, it's the law of the free market. If we had an actual free market, and we didn't have, the costs of production are really high if something's illegal because you have to hide it from so you, law enforcement. So, okay, so you want a meth house on every corner then. That would. <laughs> so, it wouldn't, that would, I guess that would be the point. It wouldn't have to be a meth house, right? Like, but this is, but this actually, so if you look back at alcohol prohibition, you had these really dangerous, you had people, you know, like it was, it was very criminal. You wouldn't want to be at a booze house, right? You wouldn't want it to be at the place where people were making whiskey in their basement because that's where gangsters hang out, that's where crimes happen, that's where rape happens. You wouldn't want to be there. But now people hang out with their kids at the Blackfoot. 
You know, so it's like that would be my point is by making something illegal, you drive that criminal element to it. Well, you also increase the public's use of that product if it's legal. I, I don't know, for, maybe this is just too personal, but um, when I was in high school, I didn't drink, mainly because it was illegal and I knew it would really, I, I wasn't afraid of my parents, but it would make my mom and dad sad. And, and I'd made commitments through uh, being in sports, and so I just didn't, do, so for me, the legality or illegality of it is a determining factor as to whether I would consider even trying the stuff. And so that's one of my overriding concerns uh, by, Ill by sending the message out to our young people that, you know, there's nothing illegal at all about, you know, messing around with heroin, cocaine, meth, whatever. Um, aren't we sending a really dangerous message to our kids? Uh, this one, with 48% of the votes, is gun control. So this is where I get out of the way, let you guys just talk. I don't know what your position on gun control is. What, what is your position? <laughs> We've um, never talked about this. Really? Uh, have we? I don't know. Um, so I guess my position, I would start from a position of humility, that I don't know how to solve the gun violence problem in America. Um, and I think that... It's, this is a specific issue where I think it's really important, and in fact, the way that the United States is structured is vital to allow... Uh, the Supreme Court has gotten in the way of this a little bit, but you, we should ideally be allowing states and municipalities to experiment with this, right? What do you, so, mean, the, what do you mean the Supreme Court's gotten in, in the way? You're talking about the Heller decision. No. Oh. McDonald v. City of Chicago. Okay, but, go ahead. So the, the Heller decision is where the, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment prohibits the federal court from restricting or regulating, prohibiting the right, infringing the right to bear arms. But McDonald was where the Supreme Court went farther than that and incorporated it against the states right. and said that even cities can't regulate gun, con uh, the gun ownership. Um, so I think that it is sort of the height of arrogance for me to sit in Helena and tell Chicago what it should do about its handgun violence epidemic. It's a height of arrogance to tell Los Angeles. And it would be arrogant for folks in Chicago to tell people in Helena how we, what we can, so it's like I own guns and I'm not threatened by it, but I, I'm really concerned, you know, when when we struck down local regulations, I, I've noticed that oftentimes it's police unions in Seattle, it's police unions in DC and Chicago that are wanting to ban or limit handgun ownership. Well, um, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? I mean, as you know, the purpose of the Bill of Rights was to place limitations on the states when it came to fundamental rights that the framers intended to protect. And so, sure, there's gonna be, um, the, the notion to me of saying that let's just leave it up to the states or individual communities, um, why not, th that logic would equally apply to free speech, uh, free exercise of religion, that sort of thing, given the fact that not only is the Second Amendment in the Bill of Rights right after the first, uh, we now know from Heller that it is it's recognized to be an individual right, not a collective right. So how could you say it's fine to li to restricted the, the Second Amendment, but do you have the same view toward the First Amendment, that the states ought to be able to infringe on those rights? No. We can get into this a little bit, but this is a little bit of a, a, a legal technicality, but when the Supreme Court is looking, so the 14th Amendment is, most of the U.S. Constitution right prohibits or limits the federal government. The 14th Amendment is one of the exceptions. Um, that actually limits what states can do to, um, they can't deny life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Um, and the test that the Supreme Court has always used before and kind of pretended to use in looking at the Chicago handgun regulation was whether or not this particular right is central to the Anglo-American tradition of ordered liberty. And that was just patently not true of gun ownership unless we just say American. Because if we look at United Kingdom and all of the United Kingdom, there is no individual right to bear arms in Britain. There isn't in Australia. There isn't in Canada. So I thought it was kind of a bad faith legal analysis 
to say that the Second Amendment rose to the same level as the first. Um, it's a fairly unique U American uh, view, and so I don't think that it was a proper legal analysis, but more so than that, like, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's a wise analysis. I just don't think it makes sense to take a really, really difficult, hard problem and, and to look at, you know, if we look at the handgun regulations in Chicago, people are being, you know, mothers are burying their sons, right? And why should we tell her, you guys can't do this? They want to. They well, voted and you for know, the mayor. And you know that Chicago has some of the strictest gun control laws in the nation, yet a hugely disproportionate number of shooting fatalities. It's, it's staggering. It's heartbreaking. The number of little kids that are getting killed on the south side of Chicago every weekend, yet that's what gun control has done for them, has been absolutely nothing. Would you want the mayor of Chicago to tell you what you could do with your guns or what Helena, how, what kind of guns we could have? I would like the Constitution to tell me, which it does. But, <laughs> so, but if, if we break this down, and if you're... I think one of the fundamental presumptions of conservatism and of yourself is that people acting locally make the best decisions. I certainly right? agree, like in the context of education, uh, but when it comes to dealing with fundamental rights, rights enshrined in the Bill of Rights, we're talking about something completely different than what kind of property tax policy, do we have a sales tax or not have a sales tax? There are, myriad things that I absolutely believe should be subject to local control. But isn't that the whole purpose of the Bill of Rights, to protect us from majoritarian tyranny that may happen on the local level? Well, it's not. The Bill of Rights is to protect us from majoritarian tyranny that might happen from the federal government. So it's only the 14th Amendment that is acting to restrict Which incorporates here. virtually all of the Bill of Rights, too. Right. I guess that's my point, is that I don't think it should on this one. But, um, if you're looking practically, you looked at education and you said, well, maybe on education I would agree with that, but shouldn't, like if we're gonna trust a community to make a decision about the curriculum that the second graders should go through, like shouldn't we also give the, like if we're gonna trust you with that, shouldn't you also locally have a decision to decide, you know, in Dallas, Texas, maybe to think, I know how we'll solve a gun problem, we'll buy everyone a gun and you have to carry it, right? And then in Chicago, we could say no one gets it. And then like over time, we can see what worked, but well, we don't the, know how to fix this problem. Actually, in the early years of the colonies, as you probably know, gun ownership was in fact ma mandatory. Every household had to own a firearm. But again, what I keep coming back to is the difference between good ideas and good policy versus something that's enshrined in our Bill of Rights as a fundamental constitutional right. I mean, the arguments you're making, I think, would be perfectly valid in support of an argument to repeal the Second Amendment. Now there, that would make sense. Do you think that that would, um, and I think that's really, from a constitutional jurisprudential analysis, what would be necessary to go your way would be, let's just repeal the Second Amendment. The Constitution's designed uh, to be amended. So what about that approach? I wouldn't support it because I don't think, I'm fine with the Second Amendment being held against the federal government. I don't think D.C. should tell either Helena or Chicago what their gun control policy should be, or Montana versus California. So as far as limiting the federal government, I'm fine. The problem is that I, I think the Supreme Court has screwed up its 14th Amendment jurisprudence, and that needs to be reversed and overturned. Okay. Um, but uh, I, but wouldn't sense. you think so? I don't know if you would. I mean, you can tell me. Like, if, if, there was, if there was a constitutional amendment that could clarify this, would you th agree that ideally local states and municipalities should have the ability to make their own decisions about gun control? No. Why? Again, as long as it's in the Bill of Rights as a fundamental constitutional right, we saw what happened in the South when we said, okay, when it comes to fundamental rights, I mean, why do we have the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment in the first place? Because what, what happens with local control, what happened in the South in the 1800s when you say, okay, hands off federal government, you guys set whatever policies you want. Oh, you guys down in Alabama want ra uh, slavery? Who are we, the federal government, to say no? Well, that's an infringement on every, you know, everything that we stand for as a country, obviously. So 
I'm just, I, I fail to see where you're recognizing the fundamental constitutional right itself, uh, which is designed to protect, which the first, Second Amendment protects. So I, I think I'm going to stop you guys right here. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I want to point out is that I learned things from both of you guys today. And it was because you guys were both asking really good questions. You know, help me understand what is it that you're thinking. Like, this is the way I see it. Tell me how you see it. Uh, is the kind of thing where, you, you know, you, you have something on the table, you look at it from a lot of different angles, a, little, a lot of different options. Um, so I think that was a very good model of how to have that conversation. Yeah, that, in fact, was one of my points on re repeal of the Second Amendment, because I thought... Okay, maybe that could move us to a common ground if, mm -hmm. if, we, if we go with that premise. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. That was, that was all very good. Uh, we have time for another one here. The next one on the list is news. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I'm really curious at, at, at uh, what you guys have to say about news and what, where we get our news, how the news is impacting things, whatever you guys want to talk about. Go ahead. <laughs> Lead away, Rob. I'm happy to. Uh, I just um, saw on Netflix this program called The Social Dilemma. I don't know if anybody's seen it. What it, re what it reveals is when you go to social media for your news, what happens is they, they make money by keeping you engaged online, click, click, click. We know that, but the, their methods with their um, algorithm, uh, algorithms they use is they deliberately feed you uh, confirmation bias news, things that you already believe in and they, and they get you all fired up because they don't want you to disconnect because they want to be able to show the advertisers, look, we're keeping this many people online for this length of time, so that's why we can charge you this much for your ads and that's how they make their billions. Okay, that's fair enough. <clears throat> but the effect is of social media as a social of your source of news is you find yourself, most people are getting more and more polarized because by design, they're trying to keep you online, so they're continually feeding you these confirmation bias articles. They suggest um, news groups for you to join, to confirm and actually move you further and further to an extreme position. And I think that's one of the things that's killing our country. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't know how to, if there's necessarily a debate in there so much, is one thing, you know, one thing that I started doing a couple years ago um, is uh, trying to flip the way that I focus on my news. And uh, I noticed that I spend a lot of time reading about policies and issues that I can't really do anything about, right? It's like I might have, I have really strong opinions about President Trump's decision to abandon our Kurdish allies in Syria. Um, but I can't do anything about that, right? Like, no one who could do anything about that will ever be calling me or reading anything that I would ever want to ramble about on that on social media. Um, and so I started uh, this new approach to my news consumption where I always start with the Helena IR, and if I only have enough time for one news source, like, read that, and I know what's going on then in my local community, and I've started reaching out to my city council members, or the, to the mayor, to the county commissioners, and you can actually do something, right? Like you can actually, it actually matters then, like you've spent time, you've, found, you know, you've gotten involved about, you know, there's a trailhead project that you have a strong opinion about, and you can actually sit down with the people that are decision makers, tell them your perspective, and watch it matter. Um, and uh, that's been just emotionally healthy for me, because I feel like there's just like a, uh, there's some psychological unhealth that comes when we get really, really passionate about something and we can't do anything really about it. And there's just something unhealthy about that. And so I found that I'm in a, a better emotional place where I've spent most of my news consumption time on, or at least starting with local news consumption. And, um, and you find those lines of intersection it's odd how it doesn't really matter if I vote for Biden or if you vote for Trump. We probably, it's probably irrelevant to our position about whether or not we should be able to build a certain trail in a certain place, you know? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if there's much disagreement there necessarily. Not that it's bad to be, you should be globally informed and there's better quality news sources. Um, but uh, some better than others. And this is actually a really good cue. I think comes from that documentary you were talking about, but I've heard um, a couple of, of people say it, that if, if you're not 
paying for your news. So if you're not using like the Dispatch for conservative news or the Atlantic for more liberal news or something you're paying for, if you're not paying for it, then you are the product, not the customer. You're what's being sold. Your attention is, what be, is what's being sold. And so keep that in mind. If you're going on to Fox or to CNN, you're not the customer, you're the product. Um, so look for news sources that you, maybe you have to pay for, um, but then they're going to cater to you. Well, I wish there was something there I could disagree with. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, I've learned a lot from Nathan over the years about looking to sources like The Atlantic and other places to get an intelligent, liberal perspective on something, which I used to think was an oxymoron. But, <laughs> um, but Nathan's since enlightened me. But no, I don't have any, in, yeah. any issue at all. I think the important thing that I just encourage us all to do is steer clear of, of, when I say the confirmation bias articles, those are those articles that just get you fired up because you, you go there because they support your position and they give you ammo to pop off on Facebook, which is an absolute exercise in futility um, in 99% of the cases. So I just encourage us all to, to look to those sources that um, will give you the other side's perspective so that you will understand maybe they do have some points. Yeah, yeah, I, I have a friend that always says if you can't argue for both sides of a, of a topic, you don't really understand the topic. And I think that's an excellent thing, you know, you reaching yes. out to Nathan and saying, well, where, where would I find some good news? I did, and, and he said, try the Atlantic, and I did, and now yeah. I subscribed to it. Yeah, so I heard a few things there, watch the social media and understand where, where that, those messages are coming from. Look locally, look at the IR, see what's going on here locally, and reach out to the people that, that can do something about those issues and then be open to have those discussions with others. Yeah, I think that's really good. So uh, Adam brought, brought up an interesting uh, question last weekend, and I'd like to ask both of you this. We'll start with Nathan. Uh, what's something positive or good you can say about Trump or Trump supporters or something along that line? Yeah, so I really did like this question, and it, and it forces you to do that self-evaluation. Um, but yeah, if I'm being honest, like I was really, really impressed that the Trump administration pulled off uh, facilitating the peace deals between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Um, many administrations from all parties have been trying um, uh, to you know, facilitate Arab-Israeli peace, and uh, they've always foundered on the <laughs> issue of the Palestinians um, in Israel, but uh, the Trump administration took a non-traditional approach that I don't think anyone's tried before, of just skirting around that and working directly um, with the Gulf Arab states, and I was stunned it worked. Um, <laughs> it was, so yeah, I, I, but I have to give it to him. The world is a more secure and safer place because some out-of-the-box thinking that worked out on that issue. Yeah, thanks Nathan. Rob, same question to you. But the opposite. <laughs> Good things about Joe Biden. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, and this one actually, there's a Montana connection here. Uh, um, our, back in the 60s, we had the preeminent senator in all of uh, Congress, uh, Mike Mansfield. And when Joe Biden was an up and coming young senator, he got furious with Strom Thurmond's uh, opposition to a bill to provide aid to. Um, children with disabilities and so <clears throat> Biden just went on a rant to Mansfield and said that guy is a piece of work and how could he and he just is so cold and heartless when it comes to the disabled and especially children and Mansfield says do you realize that Strom Thurmond recently adopted a disabled child and Biden goes well I feel like a fool now and what Mansfield then told him to do is he said, think about this for the rest of your career. You can question another man's judgment, but never question the other man's motives. And this is something that Biden has brought up time and time again. He's just like the rest of us, imperfect. Sometimes he's probably um, not followed his own advice, but he's one that has you know, fairly recently at a Yale commencement, he told that story yet again to try to help people understand that we get along a whole lot better um, if we look at the judgment, the idea that they're talking about, not the person and their inner motives, because we don't know what they are. So that caution to, well, if you're gonna, you can 
question their judgment, but never question their motives. It's something that I've seen in, in Joe Biden over the years, and it's something that I think we would all do well to learn from. Yeah, well, thank you. So what's one thing you'd like to leave with the people that are watching online or here in the room? What's, what's one thing you'd like to leave with them here today? Go ahead, Rob. This is just a few lyrics from a song that we sing from time to time that to me is super relevant here. When I wake up in the morning, going to walk in love. When the evening sun is falling, going to walk in love. Through the troubles of the day, going to walk in love. Or whatever comes my way, going to walk in love. Brother, sister, let us walk in love. When my brother turns his back, I'm going to walk in love. When the enemy attacks, I'm going to walk in love. When I feel I don't belong, I'm going to walk in love. With no strength to carry on, I'm going to walk in love. Brother, sister, let us walk in love. Thank you, Rob. Nathan, what's one thing you'd like to leave with everyone this morning? Yeah, I guess what I would say is when you're having these political conversations, try to bring some emotional intelligence into that conversation and read it and, and always guard your relationship and your local effectiveness, your ability to work with this person in whatever context you know them in. Um, guard it above your political conversation because like, no one, when, when the Supreme Court has a chance to overturn McDonald v. City of Chicago, they won't call me. And so it doesn't <laughs> really matter that I have this strong opinion, nor will they call Rob. And so if our disagreement over that were to impair our ability to actually serve Helena, to serve narrate, it would be a really remarkably foolish thing to, to do. And, um, you know, my, my son Parker is in Narrate Kids, and he loves both Jeff and Troy, two volunteers in there. And so if they had a political conversation and one of them got hurt and they couldn't serve together anymore, Jeff would be fine and Troy would be fine, but Parker would be the victim because he would lose that, and he would lose the ability to interact with both of them. And so if you can't serve at the YWCA with someone who votes differently than you, or build a trail with someone who votes differently than you, the only casualties are the people who you aren't serving. So bring that intelligence, have opinions, be informed, but be ready to hit the eject button on a conversation if you realize that it's uh, damaging that relationship. Yeah, thank you. So a lot of love, a lot of focus on the relationships. That's what I hear from both of you. So, nice job, guys. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm going to close with prayer, and Hannah will come back up for one more announcement. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Rob and Nathan and their willingness to be vulnerable to come up here and, and have these conversations. And for all the people that are, are here this morning and watching online or watching later in time, just, just bring to, ma to mind the, the importance of the love and the relationships and that really it's, it's the people that we're around and, and the things that we can do locally that are, that are so important. I ask that you'll be with us in our conversations as we come into the election, uh, as people are voting and deciding who to vote for. Help us to just be mindful of that emotional intelligence of, of how our interactions are going. And I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.